This is the polite and welcoming sign that you will first encounter when arriving at Cabot House. The house sticks out like a narc in an illegal rave, looking, in comparison to the buildings around it, undamaged. It is guarded by a sentry bot and can only be entered if you get the quest off Edward Deegan or pass the speech check. It's located just north of Bunker Hill and inside is one of the strangest stories I have yet to find in the Commonwealth. As per request, I will leave in much of the dialogue be found here, or at least the interesting parts, so this episode is heavy in it. Due to the amount of quests involved, it will also be more walkthrough like than previous episodes. Now let's talk to Edward. So right off the bat, we meet Jack Cabot, the eccentric scientist owner of the house. How do we know he is eccentric? Because something he was making blew up on him, silly. Let's see what he has to say. What is this place? This is my ancestral home. The Cabots have always lived here, since long before the Great War. If you're asking what we're still doing here, with Boston in its current sad state, well, that's a story for another time, perhaps. Pleased to meet you, Jack. And I am very pleased to meet you. Edward finds it tiresome. But I always like to know personally everyone who works for me. Please, have a seat. How about a drink? Edward, the good bourbon, eh? Now, before we get down to business, I have a question I like to ask all my new employees. Is this really the time Don't for- Don't interrupt, Edward. The question is this. Do you believe there is other intelligent life in the universe? Are you talking about aliens? UFOs and little green men? No, no. That's all popular hysteria. I doubt any of it has any basis in fact. I'm talking about the hidden history of our planet. The very origins of human civilization. Ancient powers that modern science, even at its pinnacle, could barely begin to comprehend. You think aliens created human civilization? Yes, if by alien you mean a non-human precursor to the commonly understood founding cultures, Sumer, Egypt, Assyria. My father excavated a city in the Rub al Khali in Arabia, which he dated to more than 4,000 years before the rise of any known human civilization. The structures and artifacts were strange, disturbing even, clearly not constructed for or by humans. I've spent my life trying to decipher what he uncovered. Jack, can I tell him what I need him to do? I'm sorry, Edward. I just get carried away sometimes. You're sending him to look for the missing shipment? Yeah. Well then, I'd better leave you to it. We'll talk more about this some other time, when things are less rushed. It isn't important now. Welcome to the family. Okay, so that was a lot of information to process, and not really a lot of time to do it in. So a heavy theme in this teal is going to be aliens, or perhaps precursors is a more accurate term. Jack believes that current humanity is descended from a non-human species, a species that's technology far surpasses our own. Interesting to note is that he believes little green men are a load of nonsense, which suggests that he has not encountered them, or we may be talking about another group of otherworldly beings, and not the aliens that we have already encountered. His father excavated a city located in the Ruba al Khali in Arabia, and it far predated any human civilization, and from what he tells us, had technology far in excess than even what we have today, and its inner workings remain a mystery. He describes the artifacts as strange, and not constructed by human paws. Whether or not these are the same aliens we've encountered before, well, we shall get to that. Now, Edward Deegan, the ghoul, wants us to find a mysterious serum the contents of which we don't know. As we've looked around this house, I want to point out a few interesting things. The house is clearly pre-war, and yet still stands in a state that is, quite frankly, simply immaculate, the standard one would expect before the war. Several expensive looking portraits can be found throughout the place, and it's clear that they are very old, as it's unlikely that there are that many people, these days anyway, doing high quality self-portraits. Jack also mentioned that his father led the excavation, which is weird because getting across America is hard enough, let alone all the way to Arabia. It's clear that he is still researching this technology, based on the advanced equipment that is present in his lab. 
equipment, I would like to point out that it's in better nick than what we have previously seen elsewhere, so far. The gun he is working on is called the Zeta Gun, which connects it both to Mothership Zeta from 3 and to the Zetans, which is what the aliens are described as in the loading screens. So let's talk to Jack to learn more. Hey. Yes? I was intrigued by your theory about an ancient alien civilization. Actually, it was my father's theory. Now proven beyond doubt, although only to me, unfortunately. There aren't many archaeology journals publishing these days. You really think that your father found a lost alien civilization? Yes. It may sound unbelievable, but there's no other explanation for what my father recovered from the lost city. Millennia older than the earliest human civilizations, but with technology that seems to have surpassed our own. And yet, everything about it is strange. Disturbing geometries, tools not made for human hands, carvings that hint at dimensions beyond our own. What was your father's theory? He believed that all of the earliest human civilizations shared some common parent that was unknown to history. Think of Atlantis. The myth of an advanced civilization destroyed by a cataclysm is shared by many widely separated ancient cultures. Eventually, he found what he was looking for. A lost city, buried beneath the sands of the empty quarter of the Arabian Desert. You said your father found a lost city? Yes. He spent years looking, and was widely ridiculed by the so-called experts. I'm ashamed to say even I doubted him. But in the end, he found it. A lost city, buried in the sands of the Rub al Khali, the empty quarter of Arabia. You have proof. Enough to satisfy me. He only made a single expedition to the Lost City. But he brought back enough to show beyond a doubt that the city he found wasn't made by or for human beings. I wanted to ask you about something else. All right. How'd your father manage to travel to Arabia with the world blown to hell? Ah, well, that was before the war, when he was a young man. That's impossible. The war was 200 years ago. Impossible? <laughs> Not much that I would call impossible these days. It is an unusual situation, but... Well, it's a private family matter. That's no concern of yours. Was there anything else? Quite a place you've got here. Amazing that it survived the war. Thank you. I try not to take it for granted. We were definitely more fortunate than most. It hasn't been easy keeping it up to pre-war standards, but we do what we can. Was there anything else? What's going on at that old insane asylum? I carry out some of my research there. That's all you need to know. The more I know, the better I'll be at my job. Well, I suppose that may be true. My father is confined in Parsons. For his own safety and everyone else's. He became dangerously unstable after handling an ancient artifact he found in Arabia. I've spent my life trying to figure out how to cure him. Are we done? I've got to get going. All right. So his father came up with the theory, though we don't know why he arrived at it. Just yet, anyway. He also, once again, confirmed the technology is more advanced than what is presently available. We get it, Jack. Our stuff is shite. Now, despite the fact that we have seen other aliens, and the gun has the word Zeta, relating it to the Zetans, the aliens we've encountered, what he said here makes me doubt whether we are dealing with the same ones. Disturbing geometries and other dimensions? Uh, it sounds like this is a reference to either Ryloth, the city Cthulhu passed out in, or the Mountains of Madness. So, more Lovecraftian shenanigans. I mean, nothing we have seen of the aliens suggests non-Euclidean architecture, or alternate dimensions. Also. The Zeta tools were made for our hands. We can almost use all of them. He then references Atlantis, and how all civilizations share its story. At this point, this sounds like the slow train wreck that was Prometheus, but the city seems to be one that his father eventually discovered. Interesting to note, there is a theory of a lost city in real life, similar to Atlantis, and that is supposedly located in the Rub al Khali. If you want to learn more about it, search for the Atlantis of the Sands. Now on to the part I touched on before, 
His father did travel there before the war, which would make him extremely old. Now, before you start spotting theories of, he's from Vault 111, he's not. But his longevity is linked to the serum that we shall look at. The same serum that was coming from Parsons, where Jack told us his father's confined, due to going dodgy in the head after handling one of the artifacts he brought back from Arabia. This also explains the technology, as Jack is trying to cure his father, and understand the artifacts, the effects of which now afflict him, his father. Now, we can take a look at Jack's terminal entries, which immediately tell us his father isn't the only member of the family that's pre-war. The first is dated from 1968, and appears this is the first time Jack has used a computer. His name is misspelled, and centuries later, on different computers, this is still the case. We'll learn why later. The next 1968 entry is huge, and goes into great detail about his father's condition. It seems that directly removing the artifact nearly killed his father. His vitals flatlining, total and local anesthesia, along with several antipsychotics, also produced the same results. As did LSD, though that one may have been a more enjoyable experience on the whole, for both parties. He comes to the conclusion that the artifact must be disabled to remove it, and he's not sure whether doing so will stop the psychosis or not. Jack avoided touching the artifact as much as possible, and it seems that when he originally touched it, it messed him up in a similar way to his father, though we don't know for how long. The artifact seems to be opaque to both x-rays and all radio imaging wavelengths, suggesting, again, at its advanced properties. He states that passive scanning yielded results, though I'm unsure of what he means by passive scanning. The artifact appears to radiate across all spectrums, though Jack is limited by the technology that he currently has available to him, and turns to military contracts to get access to more advanced equipment, otherwise not commercially available. He then mentions the serum for the first time, goes into detail about his father's current condition. He has psychotic tendencies that seem to be completely linked to the artifact, as drugs couldn't stop them. Then, we get the explanation of how he is still around. He does not age. The artifact is keeping him young by correcting any problems it finds in his body. It also seems to generate some sort of a uh, local telekinesis or gravity field of sorts, and the artifact is the source of this, not his father. It has also increased his physical abilities somewhat, related to the correction of any problems in the body. The truth behind the serum is also revealed. His father's blood has moved beyond normal human blood, and plays a role in the improvement of the host body. Jack produced a serum derived from the blood that allowed these changes to be communicated to ordinary people, with few of the side effects. However, he doesn't actually understand what the serum is doing. Ah, but sure, get it in there anyway. So the artifact is on his head, and has not extended into his skull in any way, and the artifact is controlling his body's changes by instructions sent to his cells. He created something called the Abremelin Field. It seems it was first used in 1898 to counter the artifact, but that it cost his father dearly. The new one reduced the side effects and blocks his father's telekinesis, though he was unsuccessful in using it to block any of the other effects of the artifact, as they cause the same effects as physically removing the artifact. The Abremelin Field seems to be a reference to the Book of Abremelin, which tells the story of an Egyptian sorcerer. He seems to think that the field is the key to interrupting the artifact's control over his father. The 1995 entry talks about a generational shift, which I'm taking to mean the shift that needs to occur due to their age, as people would begin to notice how old they are, and how they don't age. 1996 talks about Jack's new identity, John, and that he needs to be careful talking to people. The way he phrases it, it sounds like this is not the first time they have done this. Also, he has a splendid beard. The 2023 entry talks more about the Abremelin field, and that he managed to make a portable one. We also learn that his father is called Lorenzo, which is a fucking splendid name, in my opinion. 2058 is when Edward Deegan came on board. This means he has been in the service of the Cabots since before the Great War, though clearly his immortality was achieved the more traditional way, at least by today's standards, as he's a ghoul. In 2075, the glitch with his name is still happening, almost a century after the first time. Tech support have not been of help, and frankly, they, they probably just don't care. 2076 is the first we hear about the current situation with China, and that nuclear war is imminent. He speculates whether this has happened with the previous race, and that we will one day become a myth and a new civilization will rise. Depending on which theory you subscribe to, it's hinted that the aliens, possibly the Zetans, we don't yet know, caused the war. 2077 details the bombs hitting. Jack needs to get to Parsons as he is unsure of its status. 
Apparently Edward planned ahead for this though. After a month there, Edward has contracted radiation poisoning, which is supposedly how he became a ghoul. Imogene took charge while they were away when one of the employees tried to throw her and her mother out. I assume she killed him. He finishes by saying that this new world doesn't seem boring. To be fair, murder and looting are two excellent pastimes. 2080 starts off with good news. Edward sorts security and they have enough supplies for 50 years. Edward has also become a ghoul and is immune to radiation. Jack is also surprised at the prejudice people have towards ghouls, as he thinks they're well adapted. Also, no one seems to care that they're immortal and don't age. Which is also nice. 2115 is the last entry. He has immersed himself in Lorenzo's work and wants to find Ybarr, one of the names given to the city. He suggests that a large scale search with an aircraft may be possible, though I have no idea how he hoped to go about it. He wants to find more artifacts to use as subjects for his research, to understand how the technology functioned. He goes on to say that his father was brilliant and that his theory was right, that the artifact is non-human in origin. He also appears to have been a bit heavy handed in his dealings, hence the reason his father was driven to secrecy in the first place. After setting out to find the serum, as per Edward's request, we arrive at Parsons. Then after talking to a guard, we track the raiders to Parsons Creamery. Once there, we can kill them and get a vial of the serum. The same serum derived from Lorenzo's blood, the serum that prolongs one's life. Well, that is not what it does for us. For us, it removes 10 rads per second for 3600 seconds and gives us plus five strength. Not immortality, but still quite good. I'd stick it inside me. When we return to Cabot House, we collect our pay from Edward, with the option of keeping the serum. Jack and Wilhelmina are also fighting because his sister Imogene has run off. Guess who has to find her? It, uh, us. Um, it, it, it's us. Imogene is Jack's sister. You probably figured that out yourself. She's uh, a little flighty. Impulsive. From time to time she runs off. Usually with a new boyfriend. Then I send somebody to bring her home. No problem. I'll bring her back. The trouble usually isn't finding her. It's persuading her to come home. I don't know where she's gone, but I can give you a place to start. She's been spending a lot of time in Good Neighbor. At the jazz club there, the third rail. Somebody there must know something. She's not known for keeping her mouth shut. What if she doesn't want to come home? Obviously, as one of the family, you can't just knock her in the head and drag her home by her heels. Usually, by the time I send someone after her, she's gotten bored with the whole thing and is ready to come home. I'm sure you'll think of something. You're supposed to be resourceful, remember? So the whole Imogene quest takes you all the way to Good Neighbor. However, it's straightforward and I want to cover those areas and those that live there another time. Suffice to say, she is here, at the Charles View Amphitheatre. There's a whole song and dance about integrating yourself into the cult, etc. Or you can go in the back and pick one door to find her and talk to her. You must be Imogene. Don't tell me. Jack sent you. You're Jack's sister. I was expecting someone a bit... younger. You really know how to flatter a lady, don't you? Just to be clear, I'm Jack's younger sister, the baby of the family. Once I get home and get some of Jack's serum, I'll be back to my usual stunning self. Jack has a serum that reverses aging? It's more like it halts aging. I started taking it when I was 32, so normally that's what I look like. You'll see once I get my treatment. I was well known as one of the bells of Boston society, back when there was any. What happens if you don't get more serum? Oh, I don't think we need to worry about that. I've gone without a treatment much longer before with no lasting effect. Actually, there's only one vial of the serum left. Raiders got the rest. I'd better get home before Mother convinces Jack that she needs all of it. That he could still be such a mama's boy at his age is ridiculous. I'm so disappointed in Thomas. He seemed so interesting at first. But after we came here, he turned out to be just another brute. He actually thought it could force me to join his absurd cult. Need anything before we go? No. 
I didn't bring anything worth taking with me. Oh, I'm not going with you. You can tell Mother I'll be along home before too long. I just need a drink first. So she is a lot older than you would expect. And if you didn't know about the serum, you wouldn't know what is going on. So it appears the serum does prolong life, but for how long is unknown. Also, it appears that the rate at which you age is vastly increased, as she looks to be in her late 50s and usually looks 32, but she hasn't been gone for 20 years or off the serum for that long either. However, it is unknown yet how long one vial lasts, or how long one could go without a vial before they would die. When we arrive back, we overhear the end of Edward's broadcast stating that Parsons is under attack. Then we need to talk to Jack, who asks us to go to the asylum with him and tells us the truth behind his family and the serum. What happened? The guards at Parsons called in that they were under attack. Edward went to help. I've only just been able to raise him, briefly. I didn't get much, but it sounds like the situation there is nearly out of control. I wonder if these could be the same raiders that stole that last shipment. If some of them had used the undiluted serum, it could explain their unusual success against Edward's men. What exactly does this serum do? I suppose it's time you knew. The main benefit of the serum is to halt aging. My family and I are all over 400 years old, but it also confers other side effects, especially in the undiluted form that the raiders stole. It increases strength and resistance to all kinds of physical damage. So at least some of these raiders may be much more dangerous than the ones you're used to dealing with. Where do you get this serum from? As you probably guessed, my father is the source of the serum. Jack, are you sure it's wise telling him all this? In the course of my attempts to cure him, I discovered that the artifact had introduced anomalies into his blood. So the source of his insanity is also the basis of the treatments that have prolonged all our lives. The irony isn't lost on me, but if he were to escape from Parsons, I would lose my father forever. I will not allow that to happen. Not to mention that the artifact has made him paranoid, homicidally violent, and endowed with extraordinary abilities. Exactly what abilities does he have? Enhanced strength, unusual resistance to most kinds of physical damage. Oh, and a kind of local telekinesis, which appears to be projected by the artifact itself. That's why I've built a dampening field into his cell. Which is why we really need to stop these intruders before they turn it off. Before we go, I need you to understand something. When we get to Parsons, you need to do exactly what I tell you. Nothing more, nothing less. Is that clear? Got it. Good. Make sure you have whatever you'll need for a serious battle. I'll wait for you outside. Jack, be careful. So Lorenzo is the source, as we've already discovered, and they are all over 400 years old. So at this point, we can access some of the previously locked rooms, allowing us to get to the upper levels of the house. The first point of interest is this corridor, that seems to be filled with artifacts that I assume are related to the Zetans, or the other alien race, as we'll see. The tablet might be some sort of mural or some form of inscription by them, though I'm convinced the dog is a reference to Seymour from Futurama. Also, I, I believe this to be an ancient depiction of Santa on a plate, and he knows I've been naughty. So there are two rooms of interest up here, Jack and Imogene's. Inside Jack's, we find Lorenzo's journal, and a Massachusetts surgical journal. The first entry is from February 8th, 1894. Lorenzo is leaving, Imogene is crying, and Jack thinks his father's a joke needs to learn respect for his goddamn elders. He says he will return with proof. February 10th. They are heading to Lisbon. He says the amount of red tape to set this up was ridiculous, but apparently it's better than getting permits. He says he has money for bribes. February 21st. Someone called Metternich showed up with an electrical sensing apparatus. It is to be used to help find the city. 5th of March. They are busy hiring a team, and that while it was taking a while, an experienced Egyptian team is better than some local arsehole. 14th of March. They arrive and he's worried that it'll be too hot to start the dig. Given where they are, the point seems moot to me. 16th of March. Nothing stands in his way, bar a massive desert and the possibility the city does not exist. I don't really think those two things are child's play in terms of obstacles, uh, to be honest. 29th of March. They've arrived at their desired location and the local guide appears to be superstitious. No surprise there. Tomorrow, they gone dig. 
2nd of April. They dug. They have found nothing and Mitterdich is quick to defend his confangled contraption, saying it's right. 3rd of April. They have found the edge of a large structure. The guy thinks it's cursed, but no one gives a shit. 6th of April. Lorenzo believes this is Yubar itself. He talks about ancient texts, possibly like the one on that slab in the hall. They think they have found a plaza. 18th of April. A sandstorm has stopped all work, and they have to take shelter until it's passed. Perhaps part of the curse. 20th of April. It's been going for three days, and the diggers now give a shit what the crazy guide has to say about the curse. Meter Nietzsche is cracking. 21st of April. The sandstorm hasn't done all their work so far, and the guide ghosted away in the night. The diggers are breaking it. May 3rd. They have found the great temple, but the weather is worsening once again. Mitternich wants to wait until winter, but Lorenzo is having none of that. May 13th. He found the crown, and already believes it to not be the work of humans. He then goes on to say about what happened. They cleared a shaft in the great temple, and then struck several large blocks. It took them three whole days to get through them, so they must have been huge. He didn't want to risk explosives. He went in first and found some sort of sarcophagus. At this point they all shot themselves. The diggers ran away and Mitternich seemed like he was having a heart attack. I assume it was the body of one of the precursors. He has the tomb sealed up, though it was unlikely the diggers would have went back inside. He only took the crown and left everything else, and the crown still seemed like it was new, though it was ancient. Later, he finds out the city was not called Yubar, and that this was not a temple, was so much more, and he wants to share it with everyone. Oh fucking joy. May 14th. The last entry. Meter Nietzsche thinks it's weird he was wearing the crown, which it is. He has everything buried and the sandstorm would do the rest. He finishes by saying that he will one day return to unlock the rest of its secrets. Next, we enter Imogene's room and take a look at her terminal to hear her side of the story over the centuries. The first entry is dated from 1968. She's not very impressed to begin with, but she seems open to giving the computer a try. The next one is from the same year, so she found out how to correct Jack's mistake and being the loving sister she is. Decides to let Jack solve the problem on himself like a big boy. The next one implies that she's the one that is making sure his name stays incorrect. Bitch. 1984 tells us how she feels about her father. She knows it's not him, but she does want him back, and has faith that Jack will find a way. The 1994 entry is about her experiment with how long she can go without the serum. It appears that she could physically feel herself aging, and she doesn't feel like she can do it. In 2075, she is still keeping up the joke, and this presumably happened after Jack tried to get in contact with Robco tech support. 2076 is when she also becomes aware of how bad the world is, but she feels like her family is always shielded from these things. She contemplates suicide, but as we know, she never went through with it. 2077 is the day the bombs hit. Jack and Edward left, and the man who tried to throw them out of the house, Anders, is left in charge. The next one is a few weeks later, and she is no longer bored. Uh, also, Anders tried to throw them out and she killed him. She hints at how strong the serum has made her now, as that power clearly let her overpower and kill Anders. She's also worried about Jack, as he hasn't radioed back in a week. The last entry of 2077 talks about Edward's sickness, and how none of them got affected by the radiation, bar him. 2089 is her complaining that the end of the world is boring, and that once again the Cabots seem immune and above it all. 2120 is presumably around the time when she started disappearing for periods of time. She doesn't think it's too dangerous and that most people would always want to kill you, but before the war felt that they couldn't get away with it, which is pretty true. The last entry is 2251. She seems to have given up. She thinks Jack is wasting his time trying to cure Lorenzo. Even if he does, their source of serum would be used up, and they would die. Now that we have all the info that we need, we arrive here at Parsons and Sin Asylum. Now this is a whole other video in of itself, so we will only be looking at the part with Lorenzo. Once again, we will not be covering Parsons in this video. That means none of its corpses or terminals bar what relates to this. We meet Jack here and all the mercenaries have been slaughtered. Inside, you will meet several who have used the serum like Jack said. So watch out for them. Now, let's see the final skeleton in the closet of this family. So all we want to take a look at is what is found at the deepest level of Parsons, Lorenzo's cage. Though the rest of it is interesting too, and as I said, will be covered in another video. When we arrive here and overcome the raiders, we are presented with a choice. Free Lorenzo, who is telling us Jack has been lying the whole time, 
or turn on the Abramalum generator so Jack can dose him with Zeta radiation. So first up, let's kill Lorenzo. I believe I was close to finding a way to remove the art. Liar! And upon me here forever if you'd had your way, puny worm. <laughs> Do you truly think you have the power to destroy me? <laughs> So yeah, he did. His room's actually quite nice. You know, for a prison cell. Sadly, we cannot get the artifact off him, though the suit's quite nice, so you can steal that off his still warm corpse. Now to talk to Jack, to see how he feels after murdering his father. Hey, we didn't have any other choice, did we? What would he have done if he'd gotten free? Oh, he would have killed both of us. And then the rest of my family. And that would only have been the beginning. His crimes, back when he was free. It was only because of my family's influence that he ended up here, rather than on death row. The world now, it's a world made for monsters. Nothing could have stopped him. No, I've answered my own question. We truly had no choice. What now? I need to bury my father and shut down this place. I won't be back here again. Before you go, I couldn't have done this without your help. I think this is fair compensation. I won't be needing your services after this. Saving your family's gotta be worth more than that. You know, I was so close to understanding the artifact. Now that I can study it directly, I may be able to do something useful with it. Come back and see me at Cabot House in a week or so. All my research may not have been completely in vain. So Lorenzo was apparently a murderer before he was put in here, and Jack thinks he would have killed them all, us included. Now if we demand more money, he tells us to come back in a week. If we do, we get Lorenzo's artifact gun, a unique gamma gun that utilizes the telekinesis of the artifact. Pretty interesting. Also, after getting the gun, when talking to him, he says he wants to head southwest to the Mojave to find another alien city his father believed existed. Well, good luck with that. The place is probably full of fucking tunnelers right now, the way I left it. So the other option, which I took, is to free Lorenzo. Then, we can have a nice wee chat with him, because he does not try and kill us. Nice guy. Late Jack. Why don't you wait there so that we can have that little chat that's so long overdue? Get away while you can! It seems Jack doesn't want to talk to his father. We'll have to kill him, you know. And all the rest of them. How long have you been locked up in here? My loving son trapped me here in the year of our Lord, 1898, so... Uh, Almost 400 years. I think you were about to agree to helping me kill Jack and the rest of my traitor's kin, yes? Sounds good to me. Then let us adjourn to Cabot House. I'm sure that's where they'll hold up. I'll meet you there. Just don't start without me. So after we have a wee chat, we agree to go to Cabot House and help him kill them all. Also, he doesn't really seem that crazy. Killing people is sort of a standard these days, and to be fair, they did lock him up for ages. So upon arriving here, Jack confronts you about what you did, as does Edward, whom you can convince to turn against Jack. Then you can kill them all, and have another wee chat with Lorenzo after. Or you can also kill Lorenzo when he arrives here and still complete the quest while keeping the cabot alive. Also, Edward is a savage bastard. I approve. He will then go his own way after this. That's done. Thank you for your assistance. What are you gonna do now? Well, it seems that things have changed while I've been away. I have so much to learn. This new world seems to be one of limitless possibilities for people of our talents and inclinations. What are you talking about? The world's been destroyed. You're looking at things the wrong way, my friend. 
The old world's luxuries were paid for by an infinity of rules and restrictions. There was no room for a truly creative mind to flourish. Now, however, there's nothing to stand in my way. Or yours. But first, one last piece of unfinished business. I promised to share my blood with you. And I always keep my promises. Here is your reward. I will provide you with a lifetime supply, as needed. But remember, this is my gift to you. I will give you another vial when you need it, for your own use only. Do not sell it, or throw it away. After business, pleasure. Help yourself to a drink if you like. Jack seems to have done very well for himself, despite everything. Excuse me. Yes? What can I do for you? Are you really over 400 years old? Yes, I truly am. Although since I spent almost four centuries of that locked in a tiny room, I have spent most of my time exploring my own mind, as it were. Was there anything else? I was curious about the ancient artifact you always wear. Jack spent so many futile years trying to understand this. I could have told him everything he wanted to know. Through it, I commune with the ancient minds that founded our civilization. Whether they live within it, or it communicates with them through time or space, or whether it simply holds their memories, I don't know. What I do know is that it has widened my horizons beyond the tiny scope granted to normal men. I spent my long captivity exploring the memories of the ancients, their arts and sciences, their philosophy and worldview. Are we done? Hmm, never mind. Hmm. So now we get a vial of serum whenever we need it, which is mostly the reason why I chose this outcome. That and I didn't really like Jack. Lorenzo also gives us more information on the artifact. He is communing with, um, something. He himself does not seem to know whether it's memories he converses with, beings in our universe, or ones from even further beyond that. What is clear is that the artifact, or Hamlet, has changed him. But in the end, I think Jack was in the wrong. He imprisoned his father for crimes that we have no proof weren't fabricated. They fed off of him for years to gain immortality and Jack doesn't seem to have made much progress over the years, especially when you compare him to other scientists or groups of scientists in the world today. Also, how did the Institute not know about the immortal scientist or his father? It's weird. So this was Cabot House. Now time for a doozy of a summary. Lorenzo Cabot travelled to the Rubal Khali in Arabia to find Yubar, the lost Atlantis of the Sands, which is a mythical city in real life. There, he found what he thought was a great temple. It was described as containing strange artifacts not made for human hands, odd geometries, and some form of corpse, which he left there. All he took was the crown, the crown that changed him, and eliminated the impurities and imperfections of his withered arse. It made him immortal. The serum that we are sent to find was derived from his blood, which is one of the reasons that they may have kept him locked up, to feed off of him. He was their source of serum, their source of immortality. The artifact also gave him some sort of localized telekinesis, though Jack seemed to be of the opinion that the artifact generated it, not Lorenzo. Back onto the topic of the precursors he talked about. The artifacts were not made for human hands. Makes me think that while the Zetans may be one of the alien races we encounter, they may not be the ones we're dealing with here. That and the fact they had buried cities, and much of their technology couldn't be used or was not made for human hands. This is not true of the Zetan technology. We have used it, many times, to kill them. The odd geometries and other dimensions also makes me think we are dealing with something else. Another race of ancient beings. They may have been a civilization that existed on this earth before us. So not even aliens. Just old. All this sounds quite Lovecraft to me. And I think that is the point. There were ancient beings, not aliens. But to us, they would be alien. They seem to inhabit or perhaps have the ability to interact with higher dimensions due to the odd geometries, and perhaps how the artifact manipulates a force or gravity to do what it does. 
so the Zetans are most likely the aliens encountered in Fallout 3. The alien in Fallout 4 looks different enough that it may not be of the same species as the ones from 3, but we'll take a look at both sometime in the future. However, I believe that it is a separate race that Lorenzo discovered the ruins of. A race vastly different to humanity, with technology far exceeding our own, even 400 years after that statement was first made. A race that may swim in dimensions higher than our own, maybe related to the other extra-dimensional beings we have encountered in the past, Og Qualtoth and Krimv. Or maybe not, perhaps they're just ancient precursors to humans that, for some reason, disappeared from our world. However, one man took with him their crown, and now, after civilization has been destroyed, and almost half a century later, he's finally free to take all that he's learned and put it to use. The Precursors to Humanity the technology they wielded, and what an immortal family did when they got their hands on it. Merry fucking Christmas, and I hope you liked our look into it. Like, really, this episode was far longer than I assumed when I started it, so fucking savor it, you cunts. If all goes according to plan, this will go up on Boxing Day, after I've had myself a good feed. If you did like it, give the video a like, and if you want regular updates, subscribe. Any suggestions for lore or future videos should be left in the comments below. Better yet, go onto my subreddit so we can discuss them in more detail. It's linked in the description. If you wish to, you can support me on Patreon, which is also linked in the description. Go have a gander at the rewards I offer. Follow me on Twitter or Facebook to get regular updates. Or have a wee chat. Any business you want to discuss, email me at nthapple.business at gmail.com and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope to see you in the next one. And until then, goodbye.